Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is uh, Marie Mockett. I am your host and moderator today. Welcome to our, our panel. We have three superb books today uh, that are translated from their original languages into English. And we're kind of clustered together around the theme and the subject of nature, which we'll uh, inquire a little bit uh, today during this hour that we have together. And uh, my plan is to ask our, our wonderful writers, some of whom have traveled from very, very far to be here with us to read a little bit of their work in their own language. And in some cases, I might read it the equivalent in English. Um, and I'll ask questions, and we'd like to leave room at the end for you to ask some questions too. So I want to begin, I, have, I was given a list of things I have to remind you to please start on time. I think I was two minutes late, so my apologies there. Uh, please turn off the volume on your cell phone so we don't get interesting fanfares and things in the middle of our conversation. Introduce yourself, I did that. Um, and acknowledge all the sponsors. Um, oh yes, the program sponsors. Oh, oh, this is cool. Thank you so much to the Norway House Foundation um, for making this event possible. And Norla, I think it is, the Norwegian Literature Abroad. Uh, we do have a book that was written in Norwegian, which is just wonderful. And I encourage you all to to read this book. Uh, we'll get to it in a moment. Uh, and a reminder that there will be a book signing at the end, and you can get a copy of each of these novels signed by the authors themselves. And that will be at the East Wind Books Tent at um, starting at 1.45. So it's kind of a special opportunity. As I said, some of our writers have come from very, very far away to be here with. Actually, they all have, because California is far from everywhere. Um, so <laughs> we thank you for traveling. Um, so my name is Marie Mockett. I am a writer of fiction and nonfiction. Uh, I have a Japanese mother and American father, so I grew up with a few languages. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why maybe I was asked to be here today. It's my great honor. I um, feel very strongly about international literature, and I was really lucky because when I was asked to do this panel, I got the books, and I love every single one of these novels. It doesn't always work out that way, but I genuinely, each one is just such a treasure. Uh, and so for anyone who loves reading, you know that you want to be able to expand stories that enter into your mind and into your imagination, and all three of these books are fantastic. Um, so I wanted to begin by introducing I guess my, I will start with you, since you're next to me, Maya Lundi who comes to us from Norway, who has written what is, I feel like the word epic is overused, but that's the word that really came to mind when I was reading The Wild Horses. It's really an extraordinary epic, uh, set in three different time periods, 1881, 1992, and an imagined 2064. Um, I know, and the novel concerns the discovery of a, of a sacred horse from Mongolia, and uh, the discovery of the horse, the reintroduction of it to the Mongolian plain, and then after a kind of an unnamed catastrophe and of, a, you know, of an ecological nature, uh, the attempts to continue, perhaps, to preserve the horses. So these themes work together beautifully. And I, I told Maya that I wore horses because I knew that I was going to see her. Um, I, you know, the reading experience is, it's, when you love fiction, um, you know, you love the experience of being plunged into a world where you can see something in your mind and you're carried along through a story. And that's what Maya has accomplished with this book, exploring these really unusual themes. It's a wonderful, wonderful kind of exactly the experience you want when you read fiction. Um, all the pleasures of really of straightforward narrative, but that build an increasingly complex picture in your mind while moving us, transporting us and giving us an enlarged view of the inner and outer world, I think that only fiction can do. And so I wondered if I could ask you to read a little bit of your novel um, in English, and then I might uh, just start with a question. 
thank you for an amazing uh, introduction and all the wonderful words you said about my book. I got a bit shy here. <laughs> uh, as you said, there's th three main characters and three timelines in this book, and it's um, one of them is uh, uh, one of the stories. One of the main characters uh, is Karen. She lives. Uh, she's German, but she has come to Mongolia to reintroduce uh, the Peshawalski horse, this, this wild horse the book is about, to Mongolia, where it, uh, it comes from. So she's in Mongolia with her, her uh, grown-up son, Matthias, and he uh, has escaped um, drug addiction uh, in Germany, and that's why he came along with her. And their relationship is really very complex because Karen has a lot of issues from her childhood during the Second World War um, and a lot of pain from, from memories, but really yeah, yeah, hard memories. So I'll read a small passage, a conversation between uh, mother and son. Why exact? Oh, sorry, I started to <laughs> on the on the wrong page. There's something I've never asked you, Karin. He says he he uh, he doesn't say mother. I don't reply. Karin, yes. Why horses exactly? I continue pitching. Deep movements, bending, lifting, releasing the hay so it tumbles over to the other side of the fence. Dogs are boring, I say. Cows are just livestock. Pigs stink. But what is it about horses then? What is it about horses? I say nothing about the, the war. Neither do I say that horses are honest, that once you've understood how they react, everything is simple. That when you know what makes them aggressive, what makes them kick? What makes them bite? It's like arithmetic. You know what you will get. Horses don't lie. They don't betray you. Horses can be trusted. It can be hard to predict what they will, uh, what will cause them to react because their senses are sharper than ours. But the reactions are always reliable. They don't bear a grudge or stay angry and bitter. You may be obliged to hurt them, and they act in self-defense there and then, but afterward, when the pain has passed, they will accept the carrot you are holding in your hand. It is easy to know what makes a horse content. Their needs are transparent, their behavior as well. And the horse come back to you again and again, at least as long as they associate your voice with something positive. If they associate you with something good like carrots, apples, or pellets, or grooming. Also, horses don't disappear into the streets in the middle of the night. Horses don't take overdoses. Horses do not lose custody of their own children. I don't say any of this. Everyone thinks cats are so cuddly, I say, but they are in fact only interested in mating. Did you know that? That's why they rub against your legs the way they do. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, I think just to start, can you tell us a little bit about how this novel began, maybe, and how long you have been, you, it took you to write it? <laughs> Well, this novel is actually part of a quartet of uh, four books uh, that's, uh, and they're all about man and nature. They're standalones, or you can read them as standalones, but you will also get something out of reading all four, hopefully. Um, and the, um, the first book uh, is about insects, the seconds are about the importance of water. And the third book actually started when I saw um, these horses in the French mountains uh, back actually when I was finishing the first novel. 
Um, and this book is, is about horses, but it, it, it is actually about the relationship between um, us and other animals on this planet, because we tend to forget that we are an animal too. And it's about endangered animals. So I saw this story, uh, these horses and I um, were told their story. And um, these horses, uh, the Peshevalsky horse or a Taki as uh, it's all, it is also called, were actually thought to be extinct. Um, it's the true wild horse, the one we see on cave paintings, the, the horse that all other horses come from. Uh, so when they found it in Mongolia in the 1880s, it was sort of like finding unicorns. And uh, then they took them to Europe. And during the Second World War, the, the horse was almost extinct because of bombing. Uh, uh, of zoos uh, during the war. And then um, after the war, they managed to raise the race again from only 13 individuals. And in the 1990s, they reintroduced the horse to Mongolia. So my story is actually about um, Mikhail, who goes from Russia to Mongolia in the 1880s to, to find the horses. And then it is about Karen who goes uh, to reintroduce the horse again uh, in the 1990s. And then the future story is about Eva who lives on a farm in Norway in a world that has changed completely after um, climate, uh, a climate and nature crisis. And she has two horses. And as far as she knows, they are the only two horses in the world. Thank you. Um, to my to to Maya's left is Irena Sola, who comes to us from Barcelona, so far away again. Um, and I was very excited to meet her today. We share an, an editor and a publisher, and uh, this means that I was hearing about her novel before it was out here in the world with us in the United States and have been admiring her book for, for a while. So it's, it's such a pleasure to, to be here with you too. Um, her novel is set in the Basque country, in the, in the Pyrenees, right? In, the, and in Catalonia, actually. But it's in in Cata Pyrenees, okay. Yeah. And she gives voices, of course, to the humans who live there, but also to the mushrooms, the trees, um, the mountains themselves. And uh, in doing so, she shows us how an artist can use her imagination to actually peer more deeply into the earth. And there's a point where she actually takes you under the, the well, right into the crust of the earth. Um, and does this, in, in this beautiful novel, does this work of helping us imagine, reimagine our place really in a web that we live in, um, in an extraordinary, really unique, um, at times playful, but in a times very moving way um, in a book that feels really effortless um, but is actually extraordinarily complex and so i also asked irena to read a little section um, and i think you're going to read it in the catalan and then maybe i'll read the english version but at least we'll have the the chance to hear it in your voice thank you very much it's such a pleasure to be here and thank you very much everyone who came I'm here today too. So I'm gonna read a um, little fragment of the book in Catalan. I'm not sure if I should say it, but um, this book is written um, from many different perspectives. Um, there is 18 chapters. Each chapter is written from a different voice or a different point of view. And the, the one that I'm gonna read now, even though I'll read it in Catalan, so Marie will read it in English later for for you all, it's written from the perspective of a group of mushrooms. Las trompetas. El barret d'una és el barret de totes. La carn d'una és la carn de totes. La memòria d'una és la memòria de totes. La fuscó, sí, la fuscó, com una abraçada, deliciosa, protectora, acollidora, com una caiguda, incipient, la terra, com una manta, com una mare. Negra, humida. Som totes mares, aquí. 
Som totes germanes, tietes, cosines. I aleshores ve la pluja. Recordem la pluja. La recordem sobre la pell, sobre el barret fosc de les que la rebien, li deien, i se la bevien. Abans, dèiem, la pluja, i ens la bevíem. Ens la bevíem amb les trompetes elàstiques que teníem llavors, ens la bevíem amb les trompetes negres d'ara, ens la veurem amb les boques fermes, fosques, obertes, que tindrem després. La pluja fa tic, 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 la terra se l'empassa. La pluja fa tic, 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 nosaltres ens l'empassem. So this is the, the black chanterelles. The cap of one is the cap of us all. The flesh of one is the flesh of us all. The memories of one are the memories of us all. The darkness. Yes, the darkness, like an embrace. Delicious, protective, welcoming, like a falling, nascent, the earth, like a blanket, like a mother, black, damp. We are all mushrooms here. We are all mothers here. We are all sisters, aunties, cousins. Then the rain comes. We remember the rain. We remember it on our skin, on the dark caps of those who greeted it. Mmm, they said to the rain. Mmm, and they drank it in. The four. Mmm, we said. Mmm, rain, and we drank it in. We drank it in through the elastic trumpets we had then. We drank it in with our black trumpets now. We will drink it in with the firm, dark, open mouths we'll later have. The rain goes, tick, tick, tick. The earth swallows it down. The rain goes, tick, tick, tick. We swallow it down. The rain comes from places and knows things. So I am wondering how you imagined the voice of the mushroom. Did you see these images in your head and then did the voice come or how did how did this work? Um, so I had a, a key idea or I would say I had two key, key ideas, but I'll talk about one when I started writing this novel. Um, I knew I wanted to focus on a specific stretch of land, and I chose the, the Pyrenees Mountains. Um, and I knew that I wanted to look at that place, that I wanted to um, be in that place, explain that place from as many perspectives and points of view as possible. Um, so this novel, um, it is set up in the Pyrenees, and it tells the story of, of one family, um, a family that suffers two violent deaths, two accidents on top of those hills. But the story of this family and the story of this place is explained by the perspective of all those who live there, or who pass by there. And when I say all, I mean the people who live there nowadays, but also the people who might have died there, but also the animals, the mushrooms, um, also the perspective of a storm approaching those hills, um, also the perspective of the mythological creatures that are supposed to live in the Pyrenees Mountains, and even the, the voice of the, of the land, of the mountain herself. Um, so the voice of the mushrooms actually came to me um, when I was already like in the middle, I would say, of writing this novel. Um, the first voice or the first seed of this novel was actually the voice of the cloud. Um, which is the first chapter, and, and that is a, like a storm um, that that's is a beautiful, that's also just, I almost asked you to read that, it's so beautiful. <laughs> and that's a storm that is approaching those, um, those hills, and, um, and actually they are um, releasing like lightning bolts, and one of these lightning bolts um, kills the a farmer kills a father and husband um, at the very, very beginning of the novel, like the second page. Um, so what happened to me is that when I wrote that first chapter, I realized two things. On the one hand, I realized that 
it could be done, that I could try to do this, that I could try to tell this story from all these perspectives, and that I could look at the land and at the family um, from all these places. I could look it, at it like from above, like if I was a cloud. And then the other thing that happened to me was that I had great fun like writing that chapter. Like <laughs> I really, really enjoyed it. So after that, I decided to give myself the freedom um, and, and the playfulness to try out any um, idea, any voice, any possibility, like to really, really, really um, try to, um, to use language and imagination in all the possible ways I could, um, I could, I could try, I could imagine. Um, and therefore, at some point, while I was like working on the novel, it crossed my mind the idea of writing one chapter from the perspective of a group of black chantrets. Um, I was alone on my computer and I started laughing on like on my own. I was like, oh, Irena, are you going to try that? Um, and I did. And it it worked and it absolutely stayed. stayed it's, in the book. it's also lovely because there's such a contrast. I mean, we hear from the deer at one point, the road deer who has a very different voice. And then the clouds, as you say, who open the, the novel also have a very different voice. Um, so I, I love learning that you began by making yourself laugh. Um, <laughs> okay. Can I just say something? Yeah. It's so good to hear authors saying that it's fun to write. Because I think quite often authors are very good at talking about the pain of writing. So, and I do find it great fun to write as well, <laughs> even if I write about serious things. <laughs> so it's, it's lovely to hear. I mean, there is moments of everything, like there is moments in which you might um, worry or moments in which you might be um, anxious about, about something. But, but yeah, for me, the, the general feeling in relation to my writing is one of, um, of having fun, of like playfulness, which um, for me, like fun or even playfulness or even the, the game um, is also something very serious, very deep, something that allows you to deeply think and reflect about many, many things. Thank you. Our third author, Masatsugu Ono, came all the way from Japan to be with us. Um, and it's also a real honor and pleasure to get to be with, with him. Um, we also share some friends in common. I was really delighted to, to meet um, Ono-san. And, and after, especially after having read his novel, At the Edge of the Woods, which is this book here, um, also a masterpiece. Um, it's a slim, slim novel. But it absolutely thrilled me, really, right from the very beginning. It will thrill you, too. Uh, the copy on the back says that At the Edge of the Woods is an allegory for societal alienation and climate catastrophes unlike any other. Uh, and I thought, well, there, uh, this is set of a lot of books, um, you know, alienation and climate catastrophe. The part I wanted to stress was that this is really a book unlike any other, because we, as we read this book, we have the gift of, of you, really, of your imagination of every sentence unfolding in this completely original way. Um, it's also very visionary work. I feel that it, particularly as the book unfolds, I continue to feel like I'm in this space that's real and not real, and this tension is held all the way through. A lot of writers try to do this. They try to bend reality, um, and it sort of works or doesn't work or is unsatisfying at the end. And I think one of the th strengths of this book is that you're just held in this suspended state all the way through. It's really an accomplishment. Um, would you like to read the beginning of your novel a little bit in English so we can hear just how it unfolds really quickly? Yeah, I, I think I, I will read in Japanese. Okay, yeah. okay. and then I'll, I'll read a little yeah. in English. Okay. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for welcoming us here. So uh, b before... <laughs> I did. I apologize because I, I forgot to bring, bring uh, with me uh, my Japanese book. But fortunately, I found, I, I bought a Kindle edition. So, <laughs> 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 so I, I, I read. The iPhone it solves so many problems. Yeah. My, my Japanese book. Okay, I read one, two. Two, two paragraphs. Sure. Yeah. 
So in the beginning, yes. Katachichi. Tsumaga Futari Meno Kodomono Shustan no Tameni Jikani Kaita no de Shibaraku Musko to Futariki de Seka Tsurkoto Niata. Musko Ayuk Shabirushi. Rajo Motelebi Mar. Ie no Naka ga Toku ni Shizuka in Nata to a Kanjira in Nakata. Ia Mushiro Yakudata. Okashi na Kotoni. Yoke na Otoga. Boktachi na Ida ni Majiri Hajimeta.音の出所はどうも森のようだった。我が家の裏には小さな森が広がっている。小さなと言ってみたけれど、実際にはどのくらいの大きさなのか知らない。地図だけでは何もわからない。なんとなくそんな気がするだけだ。森の中に入る。す
uh, lower valley. So I, 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 I was living in the town uh, called Orleans, but, uh, but you know, I have many times, I many occasions to visit uh, the woods around the city. So I, I think I, I completely imagined that in, I was very influenced by this uh, nature. So I think the, the theme of nature uh, ha, has come to me uh, in this way. So for me, uh, this is very uh, rare to write about the woods. Normally, I, I, I'm writing about the sea, the bay, uh, uh, yeah, bay. But you know, the, here is the bay area, very huge bay area. But you know, for me, the bay is a very, very small bay. <laughs> <laughs> Interest, <laughs> yeah. OK, thank you. Well, I think I will ask a, a question uh, of all three of you, and maybe we'll, and I have some other questions, but we'll try to have a little bit more of a conversation. Um, I was interested, well, I'm, in the case of Maya, you actually imagine what the future looks like in 2064. Um, and I'm wondering how much for each of you imagining the future has impacted uh, the writing of these novels, what uh, what the world looks like in the future. Um, and I think, I'm, I guess I'm also thinking that so often when we talk about climate change and you know, as, it, as that is going to affect the natural environment, um, stories of warning are emphasized. And I'm wondering how you feel about that, if you felt in portraying the land and in bringing nature to life, there was an element of warning, or if you sort of feel like we're past the point where a story about a warning um, is effective. And then how much of visualizing the future was a part of the creative process for each of these novels? Does everybody want to jump in? Well, I, I've been writing uh from the future <laughs> uh, for i mean this is the third novel where i'm actually uh, both in the past and the present and the future uh, so for me and the future in these novels is the same uh, so and we meet the same people in some of the stories as well um and it's um it's it's always been part of this quartet um because when, for me, I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to write about the relationship between man and nature. And it was impossible to do that, at least for me, without bringing in the future. Um, so it's, it's just always been there, I guess. In, in my case, there is, um, I would say that in the novel, there is a lot of thinking about the past, actually. Um, the past always in relation to the present. Um, there is a lot of rethinking about uh, history, about um, voices that have been heard, voices that have survived, um, voices that have been able to tell their own story, and voices that actually um, have been neglected. Um, and a lot of questions about um, who decided what was um, important in terms of history events and who wrote those history events so there is a lot of that kind of thinking and then um also a lot of um that kind of thinking in relation to folklore and re in relation to um storytelling um for me i would say that um there is a certain kind of dna in in storytelling in folk tales in legends in songs that has to do with the way in which we as humans and as group of humans have looked at the world, have imagined the world um, and, and have tried to explain the world. And that um, has been traveling from generation to generation. And, and it's something that we inherit when we listen to like folk tales, for example. Um, and it obviously carries our um, values and our faults. Um, so for me, it is very interesting to use all this in order to try to understand um, our present from a critical and contemporary and feminist point of view, um, but also our future. 
Um, and however, though, there is one voice that, um, that speaks about the future, and that is the voice of um, the mountain. Um, that is the voice of the land of the land herself. Because um, I was writing this novel, and at some point I realized, oh come on, everyone is talking here. Like everyone has um, their things to explain and their things to say, but the, the land itself, where all this is happening, doesn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. So then I I had to found the voice of this mountain, and she is the one who talks or who um, imagines or who says um, a few things about about the future, about what's what's coming. Uh, for me, uh, when I was writing this novel, I was thinking only about uh, the present because uh, I was living in the uh, a French family who's run the road and his wife are helping uh, to support uh, refugees from uh, uh, African continent of Africa. So I have uh, I have many occasions to see then helping the people in difficulties. So uh, in my novel, so sometimes you can you encounter these kind of uh, scenes where there are so far, uh, many refugee people. So I, I think this is not what I, I saw, but I heard uh, in every day uh, from uh, my uh, renderers. So I, I think that uh, I, 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 I agree completely with what you uh, are saying, that, you know, as a, a place, a woods or a land, uh, they, they have uh, their proper uh, memories. So uh, in, in many places, in each place have uh, uh, special uh, memory about uh, uh, war or uh, peace time, peaceful times. So uh, I think the, the work of the writer is digging, digging up, digging, digging these kind of memories from the land or the woods. So I, I think if you continue to digging down to the layers of the memories, you, finally, you, you, can, you, can, you can reach we can reach to the future, I think, yeah. future vision. Great answer. Did you want to add something? No? Hey, actually, yes. yeah, I really, I really like that you use the metaphor of digging, because I actually absolutely imagined myself as choosing this specific place and, and actually trying to dig out, trying to um, explore, to find, mm -hmm. to analyze all the layers of histories of events individual and um, also also like historical and also yeah. like non-human like all the memories as you were saying that the land itself holds of everything that has happened in one single place or one one single place. Oh, that's interesting because i had the sense as i was reading really all three of your novels that um and and perhaps particularly in the case of masa and irena that you were, because you were focused on this one location, uh, you were you know, doing what, what a writer, only a writer can do, which is to ask us to see something clearly and re-see it and re-see it and re-see it as though the first look that we take at something isn't the complete story, right? Uh, and I wonder if they're in this process of, you know, giving voice to trees and to, to mushrooms, etc. Um, through reading novels, we're able to see nature more clearly. Is that perhaps part of what the, what, what the novels are trying to accomplish? And then maybe we behave differently? Is that something? Yeah. Well, I, I definitely think that um, novels can help us see nature. And we need, I think that's, you know, um, I'm quite often asked, what's the solution? How can we, uh, is it too late <laughs> already? Um, but for me, some of the answers um, lie in actually starting to appreciate nature and to see it, to value it, to, to name it, to know, it said that if you, if you know the name of something, 
it's personal to you um and to uh to yeah to value it and to 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 uh understand that all the other species on this planet deserve to, to deserve to be here as well and most of them were probably here before us and so and if we can start with you know love for nature that um and uh, and have that in our heart um it might be easier for us to change as well and uh, not a, to, to look out from our own perspective um for me one of them um the key ideas in 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 this novel or one of the things that i wanted to do was to um i had to that desire to explore the fact that we all live and perceive and and feel and understand the world in a different way so the same place the same um moment the same time like this right now and everyone um will will experience it will feel it will remember it will explain it later on um differently and if we add um like non-human perspectives in in this like this even broadens um more um so for me that was very um like the 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 seed or the very beginning of of this novel um and and also this desire of um transcend the human perspective and shake a little bit anthropocentrism this idea that we humans very often have that we are the meaning that we are the reason that we are the middle of everything um, around us for me uh, always uh, write, writing writing is uh, liberate uh, oneself uh, so uh, normally I try to write uh, to become a, to become other than myself. You know, uh, always I'm I'm fed up with being myself. <laughs> uh, so so uh, when I, I I write, I tr I try to find the voices which are completely different from my voice. So uh, what Ilana. Uh, uh, did in your novel is very for me it is very uh, interesting and very uh, powerful for me so you know you you can be a mushroom you can be lightning you can be a uh, mountain you you can be clouds uh, the sky so you know you 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 your writing is a kind you, a kind of a way of liberate yourself and the readers who are reading your novel so i, I think that uh, uh, the fiction or a novel uh, uh, does have power to, to give this kind of freedom to 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 the readers so uh, for, for, i i think <laughs> I, I cannot achieve this kind of writing, but I, I, I'm always trying. It's really interesting. Yeah, I can feel that. You can feel that quality all the way, all the way through. Um, do we have any questions from our audience for for our three writers? There's a hand. Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, well, that's definitely on now. Um, I'm um, a big fan of, I've actually read several of your books um, of the Climate Quartet. And I'm, I want to say here that I'm very grateful that your books have been translated into English. I sometimes think that um, here in the US, too many of our novels don't, don't get at what you guys have been doing with being aware about the climate. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think what my exact question is, is just that um, I heard something recently that they said, um, can you even write novels today without 
considering the state that we're in in terms of the climate crisis. And I think I'm going to expand that to say, can we, this idea of having multiple perspectives, the being, being the cloud, the land is such a rich um, uh, way of, of writing that I'm, I'm inspired by, by these. And I, so I guess that the question is, is about the perspectives, because how did you decide I mean, you've talked a little bit about the mushrooms and the clouds, but for you, Maya, the books that went from the past, the ocean, the end of the ocean, I think is the name of it, was so moving. Um, and to, to take us where we are here and uh, to imagine a terrible future and, and yet this like little tiny seed of hope, how did, you, how did you decide to do all those different perspectives, if that helps? Well, that's a hard question. <laughs> it doesn't really feel deliberate. Uh, for me, it's uh, ideas just sort of come. And um, quite often I'm asked, what's your message? I don't even know what my message is. I think if I knew, I would be a politician. <laughs> um, but, well, I guess somehow it comes from love, my love for nature, uh, which I've had ever since I was a kid. And talking a lot about these issues around dinner table with my mother, um, and also being very, you know, um, I always knew I loved nature. I, I picked flowers, I pressed them, I draw flowers. I mean, I always had a very um, a, sort of a contact, you know, I, I love to be outside, even though I grew up in a city, if I, I don't want, I mean, Oslo is actually more of a town than a city, but um, maybe it's part of being Norwegian, but I don't know, it's always just been there. So uh, when you're a novelist, even you write, you need to find something that's you. And this has been me always. Hi, I have a question for Maya also. I'm Norwegian. I um, spent some time in Norway um, in college, so I kind of track Norway a little bit. It's such a fascinating country to me because it's such a major oil producing country, yet it's so progressive on climate change. It's just doing, in my mind, good things in that area. So what, is, what are your thoughts on that uh, space or that journey that Norway's on? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> and I know you're not a spokesperson for that. Uh, you... No, um, uh, it's really, and I guess that's wherever you come from, there are things in your country you are really proud of, and there are things you are really embarrassed of. And I wish Norway would um, be a leader, a green leader in the world. I think we can with all our money from oil. I think we, you call us progressive, I'm not sure. We are progressive when it comes to electrical cars. Uh, but apart from that, not really. Uh, so I, I, I think it's really strange and uh, sort of depressing that we still not only dig up oil, that we still search for oil because we know that uh, what we have already started are enough, uh, too much already. So, um, but I guess this is always, you know, when you are abroad talking about your country, it's always, you have things that are really hard to talk about. And I love Norway, yeah. but let the record show. <laughs> so I don't know if I answered you. <laughs> Hello, uh, I have a question for Irene. Um, I'm Catalan as well, and uh, <laughs> I like your book very much, so congratulations. I was wondering if you have some uh, influence from other Catalan writers that they have been writing about fables and nature, if there are like special um, writers that you, yeah, that have inspired you. And also, I see that you are from Malla, which is near the Montseny. I wonder why you chose the Pyrenees and not the Montseny as your base for your novel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
I have a very long list of influences and like writers that interest me, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll try not to be too long. In terms of Catalan writers, I would say that, uh, for example, Marcel Rodoreda, who has a book that's translated into English called Death in Spring. That's a marvelous book. Um, that is a, a big influence of mine. And um, yeah, I'm kind of um, thinking of her and of her book in this novel. Then there is also Victor Catalan, another amazing um, writer, Bardagé. And then there are like contemporary writers um, like Enrique Casasas or Joan Luis Luis, um, lots of poets. Catalonia is a like great country of poets. Um, so I could continue with like a very long list. Um, I, I'll, I won't go into more lists, but I would say that, um, yeah, I could also be talking for a long while about like other like, um, like writers, like internationally that have been a great influence to me. Um, but then I would also have to add um, artists and filmmakers because in my influences, um, those are very important to in this idea of like really broadening my mind and allowing me to be very free um, when writing. Um, and then answering your question about why the fury needs. Um, my first novel called Als Dix, it is settled in like in, in a little town. I'm from a rural area in Catalonia, like 263 inhabitants town with no streets or like just um, farms um, like um, scattered around um, uh, fields and forest. Um, so my first novel is settled in a place um, like that. Um, my first novel, let's say, it is around the like landscape of my childhood and my teenagehood. Um, but then when, when I started to think in, in this novel, I was actually living in London all the time, like while writing my first novel and also while writing this second novel. And with this second novel, I realized that um, I wanted to go a little bit up the mountain um, like, because the first one is in a very um, flat landscape, let's say, and very industrially rural. Um, and I wanted to go up the mountain for this one. But then there were things um, that I wanted to think about, that I wanted to um, research about and, and talk about um, things like, for example, the Spanish Civil War and the traces that that war and that like the hundreds and thousands of people that had to escape Franco's um, Franco's Spain um, when he when he won the war, like the Republican refugees, um, they had to escape. And while living, they left through lots of them escaped through the Pyrenees Mountains. And because it was winter and because they were carrying lots of things, um, they had to leave behind almost everything that they owned. And the soldiers, because once after the border, they could not be armed, they had to like destroy and leave behind all the like guns and grenades, etc. So even today, if you walk around the Pyrenees Mountains, you might find um, like a grenade or you might find um, pieces of uh, um, like all the things that they had to leave behind. So I was interested in these traces and these marks that that history that events live in in like in the landscape as as we were saying and then there were other things that really interest me from the pyrenees like um for example the witchcraft trials um there is a chapter written from the perspective of a group of women who are ghosts um who are still like living in these forests but who were um 300 more than 300 years ago um tortured and murdered because they were accused of being witch witches um and then the 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 folk tales like the mythological characters that are supposed to live in the pyrenees and and so i was very interested in that too so for all these reasons and even some more that's why i chose the those mountains I'm just thinking about creativity, and I wonder, as busy writers that you maybe are, or parents, or family people, do you ever have the time to just be in nature and woods or ocean or mountains with no agenda? Or are you thinking, oh, well, this is my research. I have to go out and be there. Or do you, do you have the time to have no agenda when you, when you go out? I'm out in the forest almost every day. So I live close to the forest, so yes. <laughs> yeah, my answer is yes, also. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Try to just be 
present at the moment, even though it's, as you said, difficult. I mean, there are so many things you have to do and so many things that you're supposed to do, but to try and just be there and connect with yourself and with whatever is around you for, even if it's a little while every day, I think that, yeah, that is important. Think of it in terms of feeding the muse, like you're doing this practice to feed the muse, the creativity thing that kicks in? Um, for me, there are moments in which I really try very hard not to be doing anything. At the same time, though, I, I have to say that um, I have this feeling that everything around you, everything, um, somehow um, feeds you. So sometimes you don't even know it, or you don't even know that you're going to use it, or you don't even know like, that that's going to stay in your mind somehow, and, but, but, it, but it is uh, staying in. Yes, I agree. And to be, uh, for me, to be outside to ski or walk or run in nature is really a part of um, creativity. It's where I, I, it's where I get ideas. And often when I'm stuck writing, I can actually leave my computer and I go outside and I leave my cell phone at home as well. And I just sort of bring the text with me on the tour or, or walking. And usually, I can think about something in the whatever, wherever I'm stuck, and then I solve the problem along the way. So nature sort of, or just actually being away from the computer is quite <laughs> good as well. Um, I think it takes a huge amount of time from the beginning, when you get an idea, the first that spark, oh my God, that's the idea I want to pursue. To actually finish the manuscript and to find an agent, the publisher and all of that. My first question is, how long did it take you to go through this entire process? Maybe in time, months, years. And the second question is, um, while you were doing that, actually writing, the time was passing by, there were so many events going on in your countries, right? Maybe um, in the global world that might have changed your perspective or the character or the storyline, or maybe brought some, I don't know, something like a law was passed uh, that was outrageous. And you felt like um, to capture that, while you were writing, or um, some outrageous person came along and you wanted, oh my God, that's gonna be my character right away. So did you actually have a chance to um, uh, put those events or those people living with you during that time um, in your paper, in, in, down in the text? Thank you. Must I answer? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I love this question. I was this is it was similar to a question I had. So. Uh, I think it is not interesting <laughs> because you know, and no, it, it depends on work. It depends on uh, novel. So in in this in this uh, for this novel in, in Japan there is a, syst a literary system of a monthly literary review. So uh, uh, literary review ask us to uh, write uh, the short fictions. So uh, it's kind of a, a command, uh, com not command, it's order. It's a kind, <laughs> it's a kind of uh, order. So uh, according to this kind of uh, request, uh, uh, the writers uh, write the short novel, uh, short, no short fictions. And after that, they, they put uh, these uh, short fictions in one book. It's a kind of a uh, system. But, you know, uh, so, uh, but for me, uh, I, I try to uh, take uh, as, as much uh, time as possible. So when I was in France, uh, I was completely away from the Japanese literary system. So uh, it, it, it was for me as a very, uh, a special, uh, uh, precious time for uh, concentrating myself into writing. 
So I, I think that I, I don't know the uh, uh, system, the literary system in other countries, but you know, in Japan sometimes this kind of monthly literary uh, monthly literary uh, magazine systems uh, uh, it works very well with some some uh, writers, but it doesn't work with, with others. So. I, I, my 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 answer is uh, real. It it depends uh, it depends on the work. Yeah. I I kind of think that this this idea that you brought up earlier of digging relates to this question too. That if one is digging 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 and trying to find the core of something, it it takes time. It, it takes time, time yeah. but but then hopefully. Um, "Quote unquote" surprises are in, that happen in the world are not surprises because. If you dig deep enough, people have always been evil, and people have always been selfish, and people have always been heroic. And I wonder if that's one of the ways that fiction becomes can withstand the test of time, which I think is sort of part of related to this question. Um, I think we're. I think that's it. I think we're out of time. Thank you.